All right, thank you again for having me. And uh, yeah, I, I usually do creation, evolution sort of stuff, but every now and then I diverge, come up with a different topic or concept. And I was uh, reading along the other day, I guess this summer, and uh, something popped up, popped up on my screen about epigenetics. And I was like, well, I didn't really know very much about that, so I, maybe I should read up on that. So started reading into it a little bit and it became pretty cool. That's <laughs> like the neat stuff. And then I was like, this explains a lot of stuff I didn't understand about the Bible. You know, some really actually passages that disturbed me, most disturbing passages in the Bible. It uh, kind of highlighted that I didn't really know what I was thinking about these. For example, this passage disturbed me since I was a child. Lights. Oh yeah, lights. Can you turn off the lights? Oh yeah. Sorry, I forgot to do prayers ahead of time. My mother-in-law is going to kill me if I don't do <laughs> prayer. <laughs> All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to uh, study your word and your nature, your book of nature, and to see how they uh, play together and how you uh, intend for us to have a better life through through study of, of, of nature and your word and, and how you want us to have a bright hope in the future, even here and now in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so here's this passage in uh, Exodus. And uh, it says, Then the Lord passed by in front of him, in front of Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren and to the third and fourth generations. I was like, this is not fair, right? You know, and how on, on earth can he, it's like arbitrary, right? Completely unfair. So how on earth can he say, you know, but show love to thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my commandments? I was like, well, great, if you love me and you're nice to me, then I'll treat you and your offspring great. But if you don't, well, I'm going to mess not only you up, but I'm going to mess your kids up and your grandkids too. Right, so there. <laughs> that just didn't seem like it, like it was consistent with the rest of the Bible, certainly not the picture of Jesus in the New Testament. So it's like, this is kind of disturbing to me. So uh, then you kind of read on about it, especially with regard to Christ and the nature of Christ. And you're like, how do these things work together? John 9, 9, 1 through 3, it says, Now as Jesus was passing by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God could be displayed in him. So in other words, it wasn't his fault, right? Neither his nor his parents, right? But the disciples, you know, justifiably, had gotten the wrong idea from reading some of the passages in the Old Testament that they didn't understand, and certainly I didn't understand either. So it's reasonable to make this leap, right? But Jesus is trying to correct this. No, you don't understand what we were talking about back in the Old Testament. But this didn't really happen because his parents sinned or that because he sinned. It happened for a different reason entirely that even, to, admittedly, I don't even comprehend today. Why are we still here and not already in heaven? Right, uh, you know, but I believe that God has it in hand, and that some of these things are being highlighted by science that may give us a better understanding or appreciation about what's going on. And uh, so it's epigenetics, um, and epigenetics hasn't has doesn't really affect the DNA itself. The DNA is exactly the same, but then you come along and modify how the DNA is read by the machines that read it and decode it, turn it into proteins. You can modify how it's read without modifying the DNA itself. And so <clears throat> DNA is, is wrapped, the strands of DNA, they're wrapped around these little balls called histones. They're like basketballs. They're little groups of uh, four and four or eight of them. And then the DNA is wrapped around them so that they're organized. And that's how the chromosomes get pulled together properly. And uh, it's like a packaging system. And so uh, these histones were thought to be, well, they don't do much else except package the DNA. Well, that's not true. The histones had these little tails on them. 
uh, the basketballs have like strings attached to them. And depending on how you modify those tails or what chemicals you attach to those tails, you modify how the DNA itself is read. So you can add different things to them, like uh, you can acetylate them, ubiquitinate them, phosphorylation, methylation, uh, and you can even stack multiple uh, uh, of these chemicals on top of each other and modify how the DNA is read. Um, whether to, and they're like switches, like light switches. You can turn them off or turn them on, uh, different sections of DNA, how they're read. And so because of this and, and how you can modify how the DNA is read, you can make uh, uh, different proteins show up in many different ways. And so instead of having one cell do one thing, you can have hundreds of different cell types with one set of DNA. Ah, oh, thank you very much. That was quick. I forgot my power cord this morning. <laughs> I thought I had everything except the power. So <laughs> let me just plug that in. So I don't know how long this thing would have lasted. It might have gone off right in the middle. So, um, so again, you have the DNA and you wrap it around these uh, histone balls and then you modify the balls with these chemicals. And then it produces different types of proteins to, depending on what you turn on and turn off. You can make all kinds of different functions for the cell this way. And it makes it more flexible because in different environments, different switches turning on and turning off. Like what makes a rabbit uh, brown in the summer and white in the winter? Well, it's not because the DNA changes. It's because the switches are turned on and turned off based on the environment. See what's going on? And so your own habits can turn these switches on and off in your own life. And, depend, and all kinds of things, things that you wouldn't uh, suspect perhaps, like your social interactions can affect your epigenetics. What genes are turned on and turned off, uh, different drugs that you take, how your gut in your, back, in, your, in your intestines functions turns these genes off and on, what you eat basically. Uh, your diet, um, exposure to toxic chemicals, smoking, drug abuse, but also other things like if you're exercising or even your, your, your financial status can affect your epigenetic uh, coding. So some of these things are kind of surprising. Uh, things that, and, and then not only does it affect you in your life, how your genes function, but they can be passed on to your children and your grandchildren, uh, to the third and fourth generations. So it starts to sound kind of biblical, right? So, so it's like, wow, that, that kind of sounds like something I've read before. So I think uh, chronic high levels of exposure to addictive stimuli to include things like morphine or cocaine, even uh, deviant sexual practices, gambling, alcohol, etc., can produce similar addictive tendencies in children. Like the, some of these things are good, but some of them can also be addictive, right? Uh, also, uh, rats, for example, or if they're exposed to nicotine, not only um, their offspring will develop asthma, uh, not only themselves, but their offspring also will develop asthma, or at least a tendency to asthma, and the offspring of those offspring, right? So multi-generational. And uh, chronic stress in the life of the rat will uh, produce anxiety and depression across generations. And same thing with cultivated fears. If, uh, like, for example, uh, a rat may have an automatic tendency to fear a certain pattern of color on a snake, right? Well, that can be passed on. I was like, how in the world does that happen? Well, it's because of the epigenetics that allows that to happen. Fears across generations. Uh, in a 1997 paper, published in Science, uh, Miani and Ziff, I don't know if I'm saying that quite right, looks like Ziff, uh, showed that natural variations of the amount of licking and grooming that mice received during infancy had a direct effect on stress hormones, including uh, corticosterone, uh, that were expressed in adulthood from these mice. And the more licking the babies got, the lower the stress hormones as they were when they were grown ups. So if there was a good mother, the mouse did better. The, the baby mouse did better as a grown-up. And then uh, these characteristics could actually be passed on to the uh, children of those children, the offspring of those offspring. And then it happens in humans also. A uh, Dutch family birth control study um, done over several years uh, reported the offspring during, that were born during periods of famine in World War II were smaller than those born the year before the famine, and the effects could last for two generations. Uh, more of these offsprings were found to have increased risk of glucose intolerance or 
increased susceptibility to diabetes in adulthood. You can also have good effects. For uh, example, physical exercise uh, leads to epigenetic modifications that can be beneficial in preventing cancer. And the uh, physical exercise on DNA methylation patterns leads to increased expression of genes associated with tumor suppression and decreased expression of oncogenes or cancer promoting genes. Women who exercise moderately experienced a greater than 60% reduction in breast cancer death compared to women with limited exercise. And um, the epigenetic mechanisms affected by physical exercise have been shown to reduce aging as well, slow down the aging process. I mean, you, my secret ask if you could reverse the aging process. I was like, unfortunately, you know, just slow it down, but you can't actually go backwards yet. Yeah. Also, research with mice and humans confirmed a link between uh, exercising and epigenetically enhanced brain function and reduced dementia rates, like Al with Alzheimer's, right? Yeah, see. <laughs> so, so, and in fact, uh, it, exercise uh, allows your brain to function at a higher level. In fact, I, my grandmother complained that it was, when I was in medical school, I uh, was playing all the time. When my mom and dad they asked, well, how is Sean doing? Well, he plays all the time. <laughs> so, but what I found out, though, is if I didn't go to the gym uh, at least two hours a day, that I did not do as well on my uh, uh, ability to remember stuff and to do my exams in medical school. So I went to the gym at least two hours every day and, uh, and yeah, played a lot. <laughs> so, so, but um, here's interesting, uh, mice carrying the agouti gene, which causes obesity, disease, and jaundice. But when the pregnant fe females uh, were given plenty of methyl donors such as uh, vitamin, these vitamins, uh, folate and B, B vitamins as well, their offspring ended up becoming thinner, healthy, and brown despite carrying the, this unhealthy gene. In other words, the, these epigenetic modifications turned off the gene that was unhealthy. And then you got the big yellow fat mouse that was unhealthy, this one versus that one. They both have the same genetic code, and yet their epigenetic switches are different based on how their diet was modified. And so uh, here's a quote uh, on this. He says that the deterministic part of our system is the DNA. That's the stable part. The free will part comes through the software that tells the deterministic part how to work. So we are, in effect, a programmable computer. We humans and every living thing is a programmable computer. That's how we were made, right? So. Uh, the behavior of both parents, again, can alter the children's gene expression, and sometimes these changes stick. And that's the epigenetic inheritance part that can pass through generations. So in 2003, Randy Jurdle, who's kind of one of the founding fathers of this concept, he uh, wanted to breed these two different mice and see what would happen with the offspring. And if they, they weren't given the proper diet, then you got all these mouse uh, offspring over here. Uh, by and large, you know, there's a higher percentage. But if they were given the proper diet, you got these percentages over here. Most of them were healthy, even though they had exactly the same genetics. So he says, what's his take on this, Randy Jurdle? Uh, CBS News uh, recently, this, just this year, June of uh, 2018, says, you can see that in effect what God, I think, was telling us is that this is the way you were made. If you mess with this system, you're not going to alter the genome so much, but you're going to alter your programs, uh, said Dr. Jurdle. And those, since they're not totally erased necessarily as they go from generation to generation, as they go from the egg and the sperm, can literally give rise to problems in the next generation, and the following, and the following, sometimes out to four or five generations. Right? So God is not um, trying to be arbitrary here. He's just trying to give you practical advice. Because if your genome was set up so it wouldn't function like this, you couldn't uh, adapt very quickly to different environments as you go to, suddenly go to a new environment. You need to adapt quickly to that new environment, and this is the system that God set in place for you to be able to do that. But in order to use the system properly, you need to uh, do certain things that are more healthy than other things. Because this system can also be damaged, right, and head downhill rather than up uphill. So here's a little video clip talking just a little bit about this to give you um, some background. I don't know if you have sound for this. Let's see if I have. 
My own sound is up high enough. Oh, it didn't play. Let's see if I can get it to play this way. Conversely, if we get victories over stuff, we can actually pass on advantages. There's good animal evidence that that change in expression can be transmitted to the offspring. Those enzymes, those mechanisms, those genes that are turned off may also be turned off in the next generation. So we can pass along both positive things in our life and or negative depending on the choices we make in life. And so the Bible is actually more scientifically accurate than Charles Darwin because we do pass down to our children, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren, the experiences that we go through in life based on the epigenetic modifications. They will get not only our genes, but the instructions on how those genes are expressed. Many adolescents will say things like, hey, it's my body, I can do what I want. Only if you're never gonna have kids. If you're gonna have kids, it's not only your body, it's your kids, your grandkids, and your great-grandkids' body too, so be careful what you do with it. <laughs> so, I can do whatever I want. Well, yeah, uh, anyway, so, uh, it's kind of interesting. He, he, he uh, talked about Darwin just a minute there, and uh, you know, you, you hear about these finch beaks that Darwin worked with, but it just came out in the last year or so that the variation of the finch beaks, you know, the bigger ones or little ones, depending on the food that they eat, the genetics are basically the same between those different types of finches. It's the epigenetic modification that allows the beak sizes and the bird sizes to be different by and large. I mean, not totally, but mostly that's the way it is. It's the epigenetic modification that changes the, the variety of the birds. And it, it may sound a little bit Lamarckian, there's some differences there, but maybe Lamarck wasn't entirely crazy after all. Um, talking about how these uh, varieties work because let's say you change your environment really quick as a finch. Well, you need to adapt quicker than your mutations can, can give you these added benefits. And, and by and large, mutations are detrimental. They're, they're, they're not very advantageous. And, and to change rapidly, you really need a pre-programmed system to do that, to allow you to change with the seasons, right? And change with your environment really quick. So these finches all have basically the same genetics and yet their, their sizes and their phenotype is, is modified by the epigenetic modification of their stable genome, which is new, a brand new discovery. So what's also interesting that you wouldn't necessarily put two and two together, but the Bible talks about quite a lot, is that fasting and prayer both have epigenetic effects on your body and can affect your body to the positive, a positive way. And here's, here's one description, and it, and it kind of reflects modern science now. It says in Esther 4, 16, you know, <laughs> Esther had to go before the king. It's a very stressful situation. She could put her life on the line. You don't just go before King Xerxes. He's not a nice guy, right? And he can lop your head off uh, at any time. <laughs> and so she's like, come on, everybody. We need to fast and pray before I do this. And so she says, go gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go before the king, even though it is against the law. If I perish, I perish, right? So during stressful times, she fasted and prayed, right? So this is interesting because, well, why did she do that? Maybe because get a close connection with God? I was like, maybe so, but there's also practical advantages when you're in stressful situations to fasting and prayer. And uh, Jesus talks about this too. He, you know, the, the guy brings his son who uh, has uh, a big medical problem or uh, demon possession and the disciples couldn't fix the problem. And uh, they said, why couldn't we fix it? So Jesus said, but this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So you just like, well, maybe again, it's a closer connection with God, which is true. I'm not saying I know everything about the secrets of fasting and prayer. But it looks like there's also some practical, physical, uh, medical benefits uh, to, your, uh, to your body as well. Um, also, it goes along with faith as well. Having faith in a, in a higher power actually has a, an effect on your epigenetics. And um, so that's the rest of the passage. The disciples come to him. And uh, Jesus says, because you have so little faith, why couldn't we drive it out? You have so little faith because you haven't been fasting and praying all along in your life you don't have a close connection with God. And also, you don't really have, uh, the, the close connection itself uh, creates physical effects. For example, fasting, it reduces inflammation. It can trigger stem cell regeneration to help reboot the damaged immune system. And this is, I, I kind of got into this a little bit because Wesley, my son, 
my oldest boy, he's nine now, he was diagnosed at just when he turned five with Crohn's disease. All right, so we took him, um, for, he had it since he was four. We, we d didn't figure it out for a year. He was losing weight and then he started bleeding, massive amounts of blood in, in the toilet whenever he'd go to the bathroom. And, so, and then he had perianal abscesses that we had to have surgically drained twice. And um, we couldn't figure it out. And finally the surgeon says, and Sigurd said she had it figured out the whole time, right? But uh, us doctors didn't know what we were talking about <laughs> since Sigurd has a family history of Crohn's disease. So we finally took him down to UC Davis and uh, had a colonoscopy done, and his colon looked like hamburger. It was uh, ulcers everywhere and bleeding all over the place. And so um, I started doing a lot of research on Crohn's disease, obviously, like anybody would do. And uh, one of the papers had just been published recently on this, and it had to do with adults with Crohn's disease who had gone on liquid-only diets for like 12 weeks. So I talked to Wesley's uh, Crohn's pediatric Crohn specialist about trying this out on him, on Wesley, and he says, well, it's never been done before for a child, and it's not going to work. He'll be back in a couple weeks because children can't tolerate this, and, it's, and it just won't work. I was like, well, I'd like to give it a try. So we uh, put Wesley on this. It was a chocolate milk pea issue, right? So who wouldn't like that? So it worked great for a day, right? So Wesley thought it was wonderful for a day, but the next day he refused to drink it. He's like, I'm not going to do it. And so uh, I sat Wesley down, he's only five years old, and I talked to him for an hour about as best as I could explain all the options into a five-year-old, right? And it's like, here's all the options, laid them all out, all the risks and benefits. Because if you go on the standard treatment for Crohn's disease, which is biologics, basically, which reduce your immune system function, uh, and since I'm a pathologist, the risk factors for that is an incurable form of leukemia that is a rate of 1 in 40,000. And I've diagnosed it three times in my career, young people in their 20s who get this leukemia and there's nothing you can do about it and they're dead within a year, right? So then I was like, well, if I can avoid that, I'd, I'd, any other option, I'll take it, right? So I explained them all this to Wesley and then at the end of that, I was like, so what, what do you want me to do for you? Because there's no way I can force feed him this chocolate milk. So he says, I'll drink the milk. So now if you're a Pittman, you're very determined once you make up your mind, right? <laughs> oh, Uncle Al. So Wesley decided he was going to do it, and he did it. It took him about an hour or two each time to drink his eight ounces of chocolate milk. But, and then finally I was like, well, here, Wesley, this thing is called guzzling. So I taught him how to guzzle it, and finally he could do it in 10 seconds after that. And so we went... After 12 weeks of that, and as, as, as well as adding vitamin D, which is a whole other issue, we went back and had another colonoscopy, and it was perfectly normal. And his Crohn specialist, uh, he's like, well, his biopsy will have inflammation. So the biopsy came back totally normal. All his enzymes were normal, either normal or normalizing. His platelets were coming back down to normal. Everything was like coming back together. and. Uh, he says, well, he'll probably get two or three relapses a year you know, after this. Wesley hasn't had a single relapse, and he's nine years old now of his Crohn's disease. And so it, it turns out that, that liquid-only diets are related to fasting, right? And they affect your epigenetics, and, your, and they can turn on and off genes, right? Turn off. So his, his Crohn's specialist wanted to write a paper about Wesley, and now... There's been multiple papers written about this. Uh, another study done on several hundred children in Japan. People call me from around the world about this now, and they're all doing well. These kids are doing well with this. And so this is a shocking thing. And now there's a special file on Wesley at UC Davis for, for that. It, the, the, the Scrum specialist, uh, he, went on, he moved to a different hospital. But when he left, he says, you've got to read this file to all the doctors who were left. You have to read this file and be well familiar with this guy. Because every year, Wesley comes down there for a checkup, right? So you need to know what's going on with this kid, because this is the first time it's ever happened, right? So, and because we had Wesley anointed, uh, but he wasn't instantly healed during his anointing. You know, we prayed, dear God, we're, we're basically anointing is when you put somebody especially in God's hands, regardless of healing or no healing, right? So that's what we did. And Wesley, we just said, do whatever's best for Wesley, right? And I expected a lifelong problem with this. 
because Sigrid's cousins and stuff and her family members have lifelong problems, severe complications. And so I expected the same thing with Wesley. But Wesley wasn't healed right away. He had a long road to hoe to get healed uh, over, over those 12 weeks. It, it was difficult. But looking back on it, this was a better, better solution because it helped out lots of other kids. Whereas if Wesley had been healed on the spot, we wouldn't know any better, right? So it's a, sometimes you're just better to leave things in God's hands because he knows better how to solve problems than you do. So uh, it, it kind of plays into fasting uh, because fasting does similar things. It can reset your immune system. It can help, fasting ends up helping about 75 to 80% of people. If they fast for three days, just like in Esther, right? If you fast for at least three days, sometimes, uh, and then you can't do it all at once, but if you separate it by several months like, and fast like three or four times during the year, let's say if you have a severe autoimmune condition like MS or uh, epidermal lysis bullosis, that's how I first thought about this liquid-only diet. It's because my friend who's an eccentric dermatologist, he came and said, Sean, have you thought about vitamin D? And, and fasting and things like that. And I was like, no, because people tell you all kinds of crazy things when you're sick, right? And so pe hundreds of people told me all kinds of crazy things. But since he's a dermatologist, I was like, well, I'll look it up. So I looked it up, and sure enough, there's a paper, some papers published on this that it ended up uh, being consistent. And that's how I started kind of thinking about, about this whole idea. But it's not just Crohn's disease. It's any autoimmune condition. If you fast for at least three days and you do it, Sometimes it's only once for a person, and they'll reset their immune system. What ha basically happens is your immune system sloughs off during the fast, and then you regrow a new one. And your new one is more able to adjust to, to your autoimmune problem, and you can resolve it. And it, at, at least if it's not completely resolved, most people have a significant improvement uh, when they do this, when they fast over time. You, for all kinds of different autoimmune conditions, uh, and. I even started taking vitamin D, and now, like I didn't eat breakfast this morning. If you even do uh, a short fast, like a 16-hour fast, uh, you can have uh, some benefit to that. I used to get aptus ulcers in my mouth that were really painful, last for weeks on end. They just wouldn't go away by themselves. I used to have to burn it with silver nitrate, right? And uh, now I don't get them anymore. I have a little vitamin D by my microscope that I take, and I do my uh, fasting two or three times a week, and so now I don't get them anymore. So it's kind of interesting how it all works together. Um, on vitamin D. What's that? I just, on vitamin D, yeah. I just recently heard that it decreases or slows down the onset of um, uh, Alzheimer's or dementia. It does, because the vitamin D controls uh, the immune system itself and, uh, and how the immune system functions. And it also controls all, about 20 other things. 20,000 other genes that vitamin D is related with. So there's a lot of effects that we don't really understand. And like 90% of Americans are vitamin D deficient uh, right now. So you have to, next time you get your blood work done, just ask them to throw in a vitamin D level in there and see how, how your vitamin D is doing. So uh, fasting also reduces multiple risk factors of aging. And that fasting is also related to slowing down Alzheimer's, by the way. Uh, prolonged fasting, again, three days. Uh, it's considered prolonged fast, and you can use, uh, you can take in liquids, just no calories, like water. You can drink water during those three days, and, but you can also do some liquid fast that the, the liquid diet itself has calories, and that itself is a type of fast, and also gives you positive benefits as well. But again, it, it can reset your immune system. Prolonged fasting also. Um, uh, is, is based, regulates stem cell populations independent of chemotherapy, helps to reverse immunosuccence. In other words, if your immune system is reduced in activity, it can regenerate that. And it has significant impact on hematopoietic regeneration. In other words, your bone marrow stem cells, your blood cells can be regenerated, uh, especially if you've been wiped out by chemotherapy. Fasting can help. Uh, it was also shown that a slight caloric restriction, 25% of the normal intake, if you do that, just caloric restriction, not a complete fast, but just reducing your caloric intake for um, on a day or two a week was enough to gain some benefit, right? So you don't have to go completely cold turkey here, right, to get some benefit. 
to jerk Pollock if it's a holy fast, right? A holy, yeah. Intermittent fasting, yeah. Yeah, intermittent fasting. So in mice, uh, there's some interesting studies. Uh, Pre-mating fasting of males has been shown to affect blood glucose levels in offspring, a study in 2006. <laughs> so I'm not, some people are disturbed by this. Do I have to fast before I make children? <laughs> but anyway, you know, I'm just saying, you know, there's some studies out here that show some effects. In rats, a chronic high-fat diet in males produced offspring with decreased glucose tolerance, or in other words, increased diabetes risk, and decreased numbers of islet cells, another study in, in 2010. It also altered the expression of genes associated with insulin regulation and glucose metabolism in pancreatic islet, islets of offspring. So prediabetes, we uh, kind of hints at that, in males with increased susceptibility to di diabetes in offspring potentially through gametic epigenetic alterations. So you can affect your offspring's uh, sensitivity to glucose. Prayer, There's, you wouldn't think anything with prayer, but prayer also has epigenetic effects. Those who pray daily are 40% less likely to have high blood pressure than those uh, without a regular prayer practice. Research in Dartmouth Medical School found that patients with a strong religious belief underwent, who underwent elective heart surgery were three times more likely to recover than those who are less religious. In a 2011 study of the inner city youth with asthma, the researchers at the University of Cincinnati indicated that those uh, who practiced prayer and meditation experienced fewer and less severe symptoms than those who had not. And other studies showed that prayer boosts the immune system and helps to lessen the severity and frequency of a wide range of illness, regardless of your religion, by the way. Uh, Herbert Benson's 2010 research suggests a long-term daily spiritual practice, including prayer, help to deactivate genes related to stress that trigger inflammation and prompt cell death. And that's all related to epigenetics, reducing stress uh, and affecting cell death. That's uh, epigenetically related. So it turns out, too, I know that what I just said, that all this is irrespective of your religion. But it turns out the Seventh-day Adventists have an advantage that's scientifically defined. Uh, there's these blue zone people throughout the world that live longer than everybody else and have healthier lifestyles than everybody else. And uh, a lot of this, these blue zone locations are in specific ethnic regions like Okinawa or specific places in Italy. Uh, but Seventh-day Adventists are the only, or basically the longest live ethnically diverse people in the world. Regardless of your ethnic background, if you become a Seventh-day Adventist, you're going to gain a benefit. Uh, because of your, not only your more healthy lifestyle that most people live as Seventh-day Adventists, but also I think based on uh, the concentration on, on, on prayer and religious activity for Seventh-day Adventists that gives you hope in a, in a future. And it affects your epigenetics and affects how your body functions. And here's my uh, grandmother here. And here's four generations, right? She lived to be 100, almost 101. And uh, I remember... Uh, when she was uh, 94, she was still living in her own house, and there's this heavy ladder, like a 60-pound ladder, that she used to climb onto her roof to fix her own tiles, <laughs> right? I was like, Grandma, you cannot do this, right? You're going to fall off that roof or break that ladder, and then what's going to happen, you know? And, and then I said, she's like, fine, I won't, I'll hire somebody for that. And then went over there the next day or so, and... I was looking all around for her, and I went in the backyard, and she was up in her persimmon tree trimming the branches <laughs> in the tree. And it's like, Grandma, this is not helpful. <laughs> and then when she got to be, what, 99 or so, she's like, Sean, I'm worried that I might, might be getting Alzheimer's. And I was like, why is that, Grandma? She's like, because I can't remember some people's names as well as I used to. And I was like, well, if that's the case, I've already got it. <laughs> you know? And then she's like, <clears throat> you know, my cholesterol is kind of high, Sean, when she's like 98, 99. And she used to eat a pint of ice cream every day. Right? And she's like, do you think I should stop eating the ice cream? I was like, well, at this point, Grandma, do whatever makes you happy. <laughs> it's all good. So uh, I'm just telling you that, man, sometimes uh, my own cholesterol, I blame it on her, uh, <laughs> naturally pretty high. I was like 300 and something when I got out of the army because I stopped running every day. And, and I was a vegetarian, right? 
except I loved cheddar cheese and, and, and mayonnaise and stuff. So I had to cut all that out. And it still, it only went down to the high 100s, like 190 something. And even completely cutting all that out, running every day and all that, I was like calling my parents up, this is your fault, right? <laughs> but I was like, well, if I do everything else right, maybe I can turn off some switches to at least modify that problem. <laughs> so uh, here's uh, also Oprah Winfrey did a show on this on, on Blue Zone people came out to Loma Linda. And so in the retirement home where gran my grandmother lived, that's her right there. She, uh, she sometimes, I, I remember one time, <laughs> my grandmother on my father's side, who was also in her high 90s, 98 or so, said, oh, you, should, you should go to this event and take your cane with you, you know, and kind of play it up. It's like, no, if I do that, someone will think I'm old. Right? <laughs> so we can't do that. So anyway, in, in summary, he says, Jesus, it's not that he wants you to have a hard time or that he's arbitrary. He's trying to give you hints on how to live a better life now. It's like he wants to give you not just a better life in the future, but a better life here and now in this world. He says, I've come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. Like not, it's, like, it's like that joke says, vegetarians uh, don't just live longer, it just feels like they do. <laughs> so he says, uh, but God, he's not like that. He's just really not only live longer, but enjoy the, the time to the fullest that you have. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper for you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. So thank you guys again. It's always fun. But, uh, <laughs> if anybody has any questions or comments, this is, uh, this is usually my favorite time. So, but if not, then. I'd like to know more about the fasting. So during the fasting time, how do you ensure, or if you are? So I'd like to know more about the fasting and the effects that it has on the cells. Yeah. Um, one of my biggest questions is if fasting will help you reset your immune system, do you then lose um, cellular um, memory? For example, if you've had a vaccine or you've been exposed to a disease and your cells then have that memory and can pass it on to the next generation of cells. If you in remove your entire immune system and reset it to new cells, do they retain that immunity or do you have to get revaccinated? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it seems that so far you maintain most of your immunity, but it, it allows your immune system not to be so reactive against uh, antigens that it usually reacts to. So it might, I have to look more into that, it might actually reset some of your immunity when it comes to vaccines. But as far as I know, there's, it hasn't really had a dramatic effect on that. So, but it's worth looking into. I don't know the, I don't know if specific research has been done on that. Are you familiar with the work of the uh, British physician Michael Mosley, who has written several books on fasting, the fast diet, eight-day fast diet, and that sort of thing? I mean, I'm aware of his name, but I, I haven't um, done a lot of reading of his, of his books or anything like that. He's, he started out as a middle-aged man going up in his weight, and he thought it was kind of funny because he liked to eat a lot. And he compared himself with people who were more slender, who ate a, a more austere diet, and found out that their blood levels and everything was wonderful, while everything that he had was getting worse and worse. So he went on a fast diet, lost the weight, his health improved, and the books that he's written are very easy to follow. They have wonderful recipes in them. So anyway, it, it's, he says you can, you can do a fast diet two days a week by just lowering your calorie intake to 600 and then the rest of the time eat whatever you want and it has a similar effect to going on a full-blown fast. Right, If you even if, like for me, when I was in the army, and it doesn't work for everybody, it depends, like kids should not fast, right? They, unless they're like way overweight or something because they, their metabolism is just screamingly high, right? But as you get older, your metal, metabolism starts to slow down and so when I was in the Army, I was talking to people about their struggles losing weight and, and trying to be fit. I was like, look, if you just, uh, you, can, you don't have to eat three meals a day, right? And you can still maintain a healthy lifestyle. And I was like, as you get older, it's probably better for a lot of people whose metabolism, metabolism, bleh, metabolism sl significantly slows down. 
to reduce the number of meals a day. It'll go from one meal or even maybe two meals. And everybody says, well, you have to eat breakfast. Well, that's not necessarily true as you get older if you're not running a marathon or something like that or doing heavy exercise every day. That, uh, like for me, pretty much I only eat one meal a day now because I'm a pathologist. I mean, I have to really stress out turning those little dials on my microscope. <laughs> you know, that's really high intensity there. And so I, I pretty much go down to one meal a day, a nice, decent sized lunch, and maybe some minor thing for, for dinner with my kids or something, but pretty much nothing for, for dinner. And then I don't eat breakfast. And, I've, and it makes me sharper. Like I didn't eat breakfast this morning. I ate a pretty good lunch yesterday, <laughs> obviously. And then, uh, you know, I don't feel any effect at all. In fact, it makes, it makes me feel sharper and more awake and more energized uh, during the day. And, it, and you go into ketosis after 12 hours or so. And the ketones, uh, your brain uses them pretty efficiently and makes you sharper. So you can do that without, and obviously I, I'm not like wasting away. <laughs> so you have to be careful with fasting and not get into like a disorder, like an eating disorder uh, with it. But uh, if you're careful with the fasting, you can still be very healthy and do it a couple, three times a week. So. Oh, my brother just shared this recently. Being a Christian makes life better and makes you better at life. Yes. Yeah. Well, I guess yeah. you were a devout Christian. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully that's what Christianity does. I mean, sometimes I remember my, my great-grandfather was very disturbed when he found out that, uh, that non-Christians could actually be saved. He's like, well, I've been struggling all my life, really concentrating on doing good things and being a good guy, and it's been very difficult, and I'm very disturbed that other people can be saved too. I mean, that's just wrong, right? And so, but that kind of Christianity makes your life stressful, right? Because really, if you're trying to do it for yourself, it's, it's stressful. But if you let go and let God, basically like, hey, I cannot make myself better, because even if you're thinking bad thoughts, Christ is the saying, you're not really a Christian, right? And there's no way I can stop thinking bad thoughts, right? There's no way I can do that, except it's a miracle. You say, well, God, I'm putting myself in your hands. I want a relationship with you. And before you know it, those bad thoughts start to drift away, and they're not as attractive anymore. And that's not something you self-generate. And so if you have that view of Christianity where God is the one doing it for you, then it's a huge stress relief. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. There's some uh, neurologic research that shows that the things that a person thinks about opens up pathways in the brain, and they can reinforce those pathways by repetitive thinking in certain areas, and by doing what you, know, you were talking about, working with the good Lord, to strengthen the other pathways, then the other path, one set of pathways that would be more of type of activities that some people would not want to participate in become less and less coming to the fore and these other pathways will be strengthened. So it's a very interesting uh, uh, neurologic uh, information that's come out. Yeah, establishing new habits takes, and new, a new taste even. If you switch your diet, for example, or go to a new country where you don't appreciate the food so much, it, it takes about two weeks for your taste buds to switch over, right, and for you to start recognizing uh, new habits and new lifestyles. So, but if you can keep with it for a couple weeks, and again, this is not, you can change your habits on your own by self-determination. You can, but you, it's hard to change your thoughts, your thought patterns. And some things are, are good and bad, like, they're, like sex, for example. Sex can be good and sex can be bad if you overdo it or, or, or get deviant on it. But uh, how, do, how then do you take, a, or eating, you have to eat. But then you can overdo it. So then how do you think about something and not think about something? At the, you know, it's very hard for humans in our fallen condition to do that. In order to make our tastes uh, fall in line, we cannot do that on ourselves. You have to ask God for a divine miracle, I believe. And if you, and if you ask God, you can say, I want a daily relationship. And every morning say, I want to wake up and today I want to be with you, God. Then I think that gradually over time, because we don't arrive at perfection overnight, but I think as we walk with Christ day by day, that these things start to fall away from us. And we're not judged because we were born like we're born. We're not judged because we're born with spots. Like a cheetah, it says, can a cheetah change its spots or whatever? It's like, you can't do it. But as you walk with Christ day by day, these spots fall away 
on, naturally on mm -hmm. their own. And uh, until before you realize it, that you just don't desire the things that you used to desire before. I certainly appreciated your reviewing for us what the Bible has said, what Christ himself said, and uh, but perhaps it is also useful for us as Seventh-day Adventists to, to remind ourselves that the spirit of prophecy is extremely heavy uh, towards the directions that you're talking about certainly in such things as exercise and uh, which is as I was just reading this morning the mood and influence of the mother on the children uh, she didn't use the word epigenetics but certainly uh, her strongest message is entirely consonant with what you have been reviewing from the Bible now meanwhile <clears throat> It's interesting to review the New York Times obits every morning, as I do. <laughs> Just because of my age, I'm interested in who else passed away. <laughs> and uh, their obits have become really rather interesting in a, a pattern. There's two classes. One's rock stars who die before the age of 40 from ODs, various sorts. And then there is also a population that they love, love to be reported. It seems like they especially rely, relish the reporting on these of um, so-and-so who was noted as a civil rights activist or a modern dancer or noted scenographer, scenographer or a picture filmmaker died at age 93, 104. They seem to live long like Adventists. And uh, I'm wondering what you might be, how you might respond to people who would not only look at Ofri and uh, who she has entertained, and namely her grandmother, but also those in the New York Times obits that live as long as Adventists do and probably don't live an exemplary life. Yeah, well, I, I'm not totally discounting genetics. You know, sometimes your genetics can just bless you with a long life and extra health and low cholesterol, like. My mother has, uh, she's like, man, Sean, I have high cholesterol. And it's like, well, how high is it? And she's like, well, it's, you know, uh, almost 200 or so. I was like, well, what's your HDL, LDL ratio? She, her HDL is 88, right? So that's the good cholesterol that cleans all your vessels out. I was like, 88? <laughs> Why didn't I inherit that? Right? But, no. I was like, you don't have high cholesterol. You just have too much good cholesterol, right? And so, yeah, your genetics. I mean, there's a special group in a tiny little village in, in Italy that all, they all live over 100, right? Regardless of what they eat or drink or whatever, right? It's because they had this special, uh, special cholesterol that cleans their blood vessels, and none of them ever die of a heart attack, right? No matter what, you can eat all the Sundays you want. Yeah, and, and they'll be fine, right? So I'm not, saying, I'm not saying genetics doesn't have a role. It has a role. It's just that if you have a bad genetics, like some of us, then being an avidist lifestyle can modify that to a, a bit. So, yeah. Neil? Yeah, yeah. You used to drink a lot of grape juice. A lot of grape juice, yeah, that helps too. And cheddar cheese, that's right. Uh, fascinating. Uh, you've you've included two different kinds of mechanisms, uh, as we understand it. One is immediate controlled gene expression. Mm -hmm. uh, do we understand more about how, if a gene is expressed, perhaps as a result of our different behaviors and habits, etc., how the expression of those genes in the next generation? 
presumably the same genes, the mechanism for that, which would be very different than changing the expression of the gene here and now for the one who's practicing these good yeah, habits. If before you have kids, you have a certain lifestyle and it turns on the switch or off the switch. Exactly. Those, when, when the egg and sperm meet together, most of those uh, control switches are, are deleted, but not all of them. Well, some of them can survive the recombination process and the switches stay on or off during that recombination process so that the child themselves can inherit the switches of the parents, even though the genes themselves are identical. D yeah, the well, switches can be different. That's epigenetics. Right. But what is the mechanism for passing that ability on? Because those modified histone prototails, they stay that way. through. Like the, They used to think that the histones got completely removed in the sperm. Now they know that in some animals it's 100%, the histones stay there. In humans it's about 10%. The histone, 10% of the, my histones went to Wesley and Bradley, right? My own, not to mention the ones that are in Sigrid's uh, DNA that w went from her as well. So they got histones with the switches on or off from me as well. So that's, that's one mechanism that just came out, I guess, this last month. Well, in, in a sense, what you said could be a little scary. It can be, yes, because, because you have more, uh, more responsibility. There isn't part of us that just determines we pass on just the good changes. Yeah, it's actually your habits can be passed on too. The, the effects of your habits can be passed on as well. But see, now that I don't have kids, and I'm not planning to have any more kids, I can do whatever I want. Right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so no, it, but it, yeah, if you're planning on having kids like Sigrid, I mean, and even before we knew about epigenetics, we, do, we knew enough that the mother's lifestyle will affect the child. We didn't know how, but for like a year ahead of time, Sigrid started taking vitamins. We prepared, like we waited seven years to have kids. And so for like a year or two ahead of time, Sigrid went on strict diet, no dairy. She took her vitamins. She exercised every day. And uh, I didn't feel as much responsibility, so I was, was less strict than she was. But she was very strict with all that before she got pregnant in order to help her children out. So, Yeah, well, pa passing on uh, good, uh, yeah, good predisposition for expressing the right genes is much more understandable when it comes from the female side than from the male yeah. side. But now it turns out the male, it turns out the male is, has a double whammy because most of the mutations that a child inherits come from the man. Because as a, as a man gets older, the, the gametes that, ma that produce the sperm, they mutate more and more and more and more. Whereas for a woman in the egg, the egg is frozen in time. It doesn't mutate more and more over time. It just stays as it is, right? But a man, we have more mutations the longer we live. So <laughs> let's say a 70-year-old man produces an offspring, which can happen, right? We can make sperm all the way up until our 80s or 90s or whatever. But those sperm have more mutations in them. So we are primarily responsible for the detrimental mutations of our children, men are, and since our lifestyles, like me, I didn't modify mine as much as Sigrid did hers, turns out that those can also be inherited as well. So it turns out that the men are, like Sigrid has a big excuse. Anything that goes wrong with Wesley and Bradley is now my fault. Right? So, pretty much. Thank you, Lord. So, they're your children. You know, and I can't shoot back. No, they're yours. Anyway. Anyway, I really enjoy my time here. I always enjoy coming down. So lots of fun. Thanks, guys.